This is one of multiple videos discussing SDN, network programmability, network automation, overlays and related technologies. What is a netconf? Warning. 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 Netconf or Network Configuration Protocol is defined in RFC 6241 and we're told that the Network Configuration Protocol or Netconf provides mechanisms to install, manipulate and delete the configuration of network devices. It uses extensible markup language or XML based data encoding for the configuration data as well as for the protocol messages. The NetConf protocol operations are realized as remote procedure calls. So NetConf is a way to configure network devices. NetConf is one of the southbound protocols that can be used between open daylight and network devices. However, NetConf doesn't have to be used with a controller. The advantage of using a controller is abstraction. So you can use a northbound interface and a higher level programming language to manipulate network devices using a low level protocol such as NetConf. You can use NetConf as an example with Cisco IOS XE software as well as XR software. So here's an example of SSHing to a network device and seeing the capabilities of that network device. The format used here is XML. Here's an example of a request and a response. Here's a request with a CLI block format. Notice here is data configuring a network device. So why aren't we using Simple Network Management Protocol or SNMP to do that? Well, this RFC 3535, the overview of the 2002 IAB Network Management Workshop gives us some reasons and gives us reasons why NetConf is being used as a replacement or a better tool than SNMP. We told that the SNMP protocol was created in the late 1980s. Version one has been widely deployed, but has problems with security whereas version three addresses some security requirements. This RFC tells us some of the advantages and disadvantages of SNMP. It was created once again in the late 1980s and has been widely implemented and deployed. It works reasonably well for device monitoring. The stateless nature of SNMP is useful for statistical and status polling. It's widely deployed for basic monitoring using some core MIBs or management information bases. But notice some of the problems. Standardized MIB modules often lack writable MIB objects, which can be used for configuration. And this leads to a situation where the interesting writable objects exist in proprietary MIB modules. There are scaling problems with regard to the number of objects in a device. SNMP provides reasonable performance for the retrieval of a small amount of data from many devices, but it becomes slow when retrieving large amounts of data, such as routing tables from a few devices. There's too little deployment of writable MIB modules. The SNMP transactional model and the protocol constraints make it more complex to implement MIBs. And here's a major problem. SNMP does not support the easy retrieval and playback of configurations. One part of the problem is that it's not easy to identify configuration objects. Another part of the problem is that the naming system is very specific and physical device reconfigurations can thus break the capability to play back a previous configuration. Here's another major problem. There is often a semantic mismatch between the task-oriented view of the world, usually preferred by operators, and the data-centric view of the world provided by SNMP. Mapping a task-oriented view to a data-centric view 
often requires some non-trivial code on the management application side. Several standardized MIB modules lack a description of high-level procedures. It's often not obvious from reading the MIB modules how certain high-level tasks are to be accomplished, which leads to several different ways to achieve the same goal, which increases costs and hinders interoperability. So essentially, there are a lot of problems with SNMP. There's poor security, it's not easy to read, it's not easy to match tasks with data-centric views, and a major problem is that it's not easy to retrieve and playback configurations. SNMP is good for monitoring, but it's not good for configuring devices. When you make changes, you're not necessarily sure that the changes have been made properly. Now this RFC continues talking about various protocols, and it also includes a discussion about CLI, Telnet, and SSH. We told that most devices have a CLI, which is great for humans, and Telnet or SSH can be used to configure devices remotely. CLIs pass and execute commands. Command line interfaces are generally task oriented which makes them easier to use for human operators and is one of the reasons that they're still very popular even today. A saved sequence of textual commands can be easily replayed. Simple substitutions can be made using text processing tools. How often do you use Notepad if you're on Windows or an equivalent text editor to make configuration changes? It's also easy to learn at least parts of the command line interface in order to create the initial configuration. That's what we as network people have learned to do. So once that's happened, it's natural for people like you and I to use the same interface and abstractions for automating configuration changes. A command line interface doesn't require any special applications. Talnet and SSH are readily available on network devices. Command lines provide context-sensitive help that helps reduce the learning curve. However, command line interfaces lack a common data model. It's very possible that the same command on different devices, even from the same vendor, behaves differently. The command line is targeted at humans, which can adapt to minor syntax and format changes easily. This is a problem, however, for programs. So using command line interfaces as a programmatic interface is troublesome because of passing complexities. Ideally, we shouldn't be using the CLI for programmatic changes to network devices. Command line interfaces also lack proper version control for the syntax and semantics. It's therefore time consuming and error prone to maintain programs or scripts that interface with different versions of a command line interface. Another problem is that command line interfaces are proprietary. They cannot be used efficiently to automate processes when you have devices from multiple vendors. So there are advantages with the CLI, but there are also disadvantages with the CLI. This, this RFC also discusses other options that can be used. And then it discusses the operator requirements. Now out of this management workshop, NetConf, was created to try and resolve a lot of the operator problems and issues with SNMP and traditional configuration mechanisms. So the NetConf protocol defines a simple mechanism through which a network device can be managed, configuration data information can be retrieved, and new configuration data can be uploaded and manipulated. The protocol allows the devices to expose a full formal API or application programming interface. Applications can use the straightforward API to send and retrieve full and partial configuration sets. So the thing to remember about NetConf is NetConf is designed for applications, not necessarily for humans. It provides a API or an interface for network devices to be configured using programmatic means. One of the companies that Cisco acquired is TailF. TailF are very much involved in the use of NetConf and Yang data models for the configuration of network devices. A good place to go for 
software-defined networking or development is developer.cisco.com. Under technologies, under networking, you'll find the Network Services Orchestrator or NSO. This is the Cisco product that came out of the TailF acquisition. So the Network Services Orchestrator is enabled by TailF to provide end-to-end -end automation. So the big focus here is using NetConf, ConfD, Yang data models, and other related technologies for the configuration of network devices. The Cisco developer website gives you access to NSO Learning Labs if you want to get more details. Now, the TailF website provides some good information about NetConf, and there's a great presentation that's about 10 minutes in length discussing why you want to use NetConf. I've discussed a lot of the details in this video, but this gives you a different perspective. They also list a number of RFCs that you may be interested in having a look at and give you reasons why NetConf is better than other approaches. And they list some of the key capabilities of NetConf. The TailF website also has an education section which contains various free videos talking about NetConf, talking about Yang, talking about data types and other related technologies. Some good information here. If you only want to have a brief overview of NetConf, have a listen to this tail F 10 minute video. It's very good. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please like it and please subscribe to my YouTube channel. I wish you all the very best.